You're listening to another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. So sit back and relax as myself, Brandon, and my buddy Hamish discuss the latest in the world of finance and stock market investing. Now, a quick reminder before we get into the podcast is that nothing in this podcast should be taken on as personal financial advice. If you're ever unsure about your finances or investing and you need some help, make sure you reach out to a qualified financial advisor. But with all that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back. Welcome back, Hamish. What's going on? Not a lot. Have you uh, been keeping up with uh, what uh, Google's been doing this week? Continue oh, we got an to, update, uh, do we? Yeah, we do have a well, little bit th- of a... Well, that was last week we were talking about it, wasn't it? Yeah, we were. So We um, spent like the back half of the podcast just rambling about that, uh, what's it called? News Media Bargaining, bargaining code. code. Yeah, basically yeah. where the, the government's <laughs> trying to force Google and Facebook to pay for links. To media company websites, but um, oh my gosh, yeah, Google, don't get us started again. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I feel like that we could talk about this every single week for for as long as possible because it's yeah. going to go on for as long as possible. But um, yeah, I mean, Google's now threatening to remove their search entirely, which would not be good. I feel like what? if they, I feel like if they remove their search entirely, I'm probably just going to move. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to move to America. I, f- yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's just too much of a valuable service. I don't, it's so valuable. Uh, just yeah. imagine if, imagine what would happen if Google, because it's like, you know, it's it's the f- default search engine for all the different phones as well. It's the default search engine for browsers and blah, blah, blah. Imagine if when people tried to search for something, it just said, um, Google has been, uh, you know, the news media bargaining code has meant that Google has, Google search has left Australia. You can no longer use it. If you would like to reverse this, please contact the Australian government at this email address and this phone number. (laughs) Imagine if they just did that. That would be absolutely savage. There would be millions of complaints almost immediately yeah to to the government to try and reverse that because yeah that is just imagine if like your search on your phone just stopped working or you had to go into your browser and instead of just typing in a search you had to go to bing.com God. and then so, yeah so, it just wouldn't work yeah I mean, the Australian government better back down because, I mean, in all honesty, they are not going to win this. There's just no way they're going to win. The, the amazing thing to me is that the ACCC and the Australian government have taken zero time to consult what people actually want. Yeah. Like because they're being lobbied. Well, I mean, yeah, true. It shouldn't be surprising <laughs> at all, but it, it just, it's kind of insane to me. The the head of the ACCC, Rob Sims, said this um, this week, he basically gave an explanation for what would happen if Google didn't exist in Australia. It's pretty mm. funny. Um, so, he said, um, if you had, for example, two or three search engines that had much more equal market share than now is the case where Google has basically a monopoly, uh, Mm. then you do not have a bargaining power imbalance and it may be well that the code doesn't apply. They will still do deals with news media businesses because competition will encourage them to do so. And the the hilarious thing about this is I I find it funny that the ACCC doesn't seem to understand that as users, we don't really want multiple search engines. Imagine imagine you searching for something. You're just like, oh, I want to see what's something. I want to see the cricket scores. You search cricket scores and uh, you click Cricket Australia and uh, the search engine goes, sorry, this link is uh, unavailable. It's exclusively on Bing because (laughs) they've paid for the link. Like, what the hell is that? Yeah, that's just the dumbest system. To be honest, the ACCC, they're puffing their chest out, but like, come on. Can you not see that this, no matter how you look at this, this is a losing battle. Like, while it would suck for Google to remove themselves from Australia and that would cost them some revenue, it's not going to cost them a lot. We're really not that important in the context of the global economy. And really, you're just going to screw over your citizens. It's the citizens, if this happens and they publish off their chest out and say, no, 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 Google, we're holding firm. Then it's just us. We're going to lose out. Yeah. And we're the ones that are going to suffer. And the hilarious thing as well is if Google, if Google does decide to leave, the media companies lose as well. <laughs> like the media yeah, companies exactly. don't win by Google leaving. They lose all their traffic and they will die faster than they already are dying. So exactly. <laughs> lose, lose, lose. <laughs> anyway, just thought we'd start off with a fiery one just to get us fiery, in the mood. Yeah. Focus that's an interesting up. update. 
Anyway, let's get stuck in. We got lots. Of, we got earnings to talk about today. We're going to cover Facebook, uh, Apple, and Tesla. Mm. Uh, some interesting things to talk about today. So, uh, oh, also, <laughs> how could I forget GameStop? Ooh. Holy smokes! Just a little teaser. It's gone up one thousand six hundred and forty-one percent in ten days. <laughs> anyway, Hamish, into the sponsor. So today's episode is sponsored by ShareSite, and ShareSite is an application you can use to track the performance of your stock portfolio. So it will allow you to keep track of all of the different types of gains, capital gains, dividends. If you have dividend reinvestment plans, then it will do all of those calculations for you. Uh, Currency gains, if you're buying shares internationally or you hold foreign currencies. And then the main reason why I personally have been using it over the past three or four years is when it comes to tax time. So ShareSite generates up to 10 different reports that can be easily used at, at, at tax time to work out things such as capital gains, dividend income, and more. And at the moment, you can try ShareSite for free by heading over to sharesite.com forward slash young investors. That's site spelt S-I-G-H-T, sharesite.com forward slash young investors. You can use that link to sign up to a free plan and use it for as long as you want. And if you want to use that link, you can to sign up to a paid plan and get four months free when you sign up to a yearly subscription. So go check it out if you're interested. Uh, What should we talk about first? I feel like we should start with GameStop. I feel like this is Games, what, yeah, everyone's GameStop. probably wondering what we what we think about all of this. Holy <laughs> smoke. So yeah, as I said before, GameStop GameStop stock. That's really it's a hard. It's a mouthful. It's a tongue twister, isn't it? GameStop yeah. stock. Uh up 1,641% in 10 days. What the hell? Overnight it was up 134%. Hmm. Which is just nuts. Um, have you been following along this story very much? Yeah, uh, I mean moderately. I haven't yeah. done any sort of deep research into into anything here, but yeah. yeah, I mean it's hard not to to be up to date with what's happening. It's just bonkers. I mean, it was like last week we were, I was messaging you saying, "Look, GameStop just went up fifty percent overnight," yeah. and it's just kept going. Now, it's yesterday, uh, sorry, the day before yesterday, I was up a hundred percent or ninety two percent, I think, and now up a hundred and thirty four percent overnight, which is just ridiculous, and obviously. There's nothing that's changed with their business that could uh, actually make these sort of results justified. <laughs> um, this is, well, I'll, I'll give you the, the background. This is essentially, uh, this stock has been heavily, heavily shorted. So, a lot of the shares are held short. In fact, 140% of the float shares were held short. <laughs> that's insane. Um which is insane. Yeah. So, the float shares are the number of shares available for trading and over it's over 100% because when it comes to short selling, you can loan- You can obviously loan something multiple times. Like if I had a baseball bat and I loaned it to Hamish um, and said, hey, just give it back to me next week. Hamish could then go and loan the baseball bat out to somebody else in the meantime. Says, hey, just give it back to me by next week so I can give it back to Brandon next week. So, that's how you kind of get- Because short selling is the idea of borrowing shares- and then selling them, and then eventually you have to buy them back to return them. Mm. You can end up getting these mass, like over a hundred percent of the outstanding shares just being held in a short position, which is quite bizarre. Um, I actually had to research that because it didn't make sense to me, and then I was like, <laughs> "Oh, there you go." Um, so yeah, anyway, this is the ridiculously shorted stock. And then what? Th- there's this subreddit which you probably heard of called Wall Street <laughs> Bets, which is usually just people that just like gambling. You know, it's people posting. I've put my whole life savings on this stock, and it's just like outrageous bets mm. <laughs> in the stock market, essentially. But recently, they have been collectively targeting heavily shorted stocks. Um, they've been buying shares and also options in them. And they've been trying to trigger an uptick in the share price in these really heavily shorted <laughs> stocks, which then causes a short squeeze. And as you can see in GameStop's <laughs> case, then they've done that quite uh, successfully, <laughs> I it's would say. crazy because it's yeah. really just like kind of like a meme page. Where people just kind of like just make jokes about just speculating on investments and gambling on certain things. But now there's kind of like it, they've, it's like they've banded together in solidarity yeah. and said, we're going to start targeting short <laughs> sellers. And actually, because they've realized that, I mean, the subreddit has what, like 2 million People it's following it. it has millions of people who are posting on it or hundreds of thousands of people that are posting on it. 
And uh, well, through GameStop, I think is kind of the first one that they've they've moved significantly. They've realized if they band this has together, been the biggest one. It's been the yeah, true. I mean, obviously they've moved shares previously, but this is kind of the first like big case where they've seen that if a stock is heavily shorted, how much they can actually move it. Sixteen hundred percent is just mm. off the charts. Yeah, insane. Yeah. So, so, yeah, essentially what's happening is that they're triggering a short squeeze, which if you're not familiar, so short selling is this idea of borrowing someone else's shares, selling them when you think the stock price is high, and then waiting for the stock price to fall and then buying back the shares cheap so that you can then return the shares that you borrowed. So, if you sell it high and then you buy it low, then you profit the difference. Um, The problem is, is that um, if you have... If you have borrowed and sold um, something, then you like you've borrowed something. You have to give it back. So you do mm. have to buy back those shares at some point. That's the inescapable thing about short selling. You have to buy back the shares at some point. Um, so what happens if the stock price goes up after you borrow and sell the shares? Well, you're mm. losing money. But here's the thing: is that the stock price can continue to go up and up and up and up and up, and it can keep going up forever. Eventually, it can go up so much that you are essentially forced to cover your short. Mm. Um, You can't keep that position open anymore. You just have to take the L because your life is being destroyed. Um, (laughs) So, you buy the shares at a loss and then you return them to their owner. Uh, The problem is, is that when people are forced to do that, to close a short position, you have to buy back stock. So, buying stock adds to the buying pressure. And if you get a lot of shares which are being held short, if you've got a lot of short sellers that are being forced to close their shorts, then they're all buying back the stock at the same pri- uh, at the same time, which causes the price to go up a lot. Um, wow. So, that's essentially what the short squeeze is and that's what's happening to GameStop stop, far out, game stop at the moment. <laughs> um, but there's another thing that I didn't, I had to research this because I uh, I didn't know how this worked. People were saying this is called a gamma squeeze as well. Have you heard of a gamma squeeze before? No, I haven't. It's really quite bizarre. So, a gamma squeeze is caused when there's a lot of people buying options, which is right. obviously what the, what the Redditors are doing as well as just buying the stock. They're also buying like options on uh, GameStop. So, a gamma squeeze is where the market maker who's selling the, the call options to these, these Wall Street bettors, mm-hmm. um, they've obviously got a huge risk um, if the stock goes up drastically. Right. Um, but, you know, they still, want to, they, they still want to be in the game. They're the market maker. They still make their money. So, how, how do they cover their risk? Well, a lot of the times they just cover their risk of the call options um, them, you know, the call options being very valuable. They cover that risk by buying the underlying stock. Yes. And then the higher the stock price goes, the more they buy. So, what you've actually got is now the market makers who are selling the call options to all these Wall Street bettors that want to buy them are also now buying heavily into the underlying stock to reduce their risk. Yes. Because on the- <laughs> which, in its, which in itself is driving the stock price higher. Yes, exactly. Because on the other side of the option, if you're, if you're buying a, a call option, you have the option but not the obligation to buy the stock. But on the other mm. side, you have someone who is obligated to sell that stock to you. And if they yeah. don't have the stock, then that's very risky to them. But yeah, they can exactly. reduce their risk by buying the stock as it rises so that they have it when you say, hey, I want to execute my option. I want to take yep. those shares. So, they can protect themselves by making sure they have the stock uh, yeah, exactly. rather than doing um, what is a naked, selling a naked call option where you don't have the stock. And that's obviously incredibly risky um, in, a, in the same way to shorting the stock. You may need to buy it at any price that's really, really high. Um, mm. I didn't know that had a name. That's uh, interesting. Gamma squeeze. That sounds really yeah, fancy. <laughs> it's a trading term. Like there's a, apparently with options trading and market makers, there's there's like delta and gamma, which are two different risks or something okay. that they need to minimize. So, this is just uh, um, the gamma side. But I, to be honest, I, I know nothing about it. I'm not an options dude. So, um, but yeah, no, very well explained, Hamish, much better than I explained it. But uh, yeah, how how bizarre that a small group, well, a pretty large group, to be honest, of retail investors, of Wall Street bettors are causing this sort of stock price um, rise. And it'll be interesting to see what the uh, SEC think about it too. Yes, that um, is going to be very interesting. 
I mean, that's what the so a lot of hedge funds are losing a hell of a lot of money at the moment from being short GameStop, and most of them have now had to cover their shorts and taken massive losses. But all of them are crying to the SEC for <laughs> um, stock market manipulation mm. from the Wall Street betters. But the funny thing is, the on the other side of the equation, the Wall Street betters are basically just saying, well. You get what you give because obviously hedge funds could also be pretty guilty of uh, stock market manipulation in many aspects as well. So Yeah, I, I wonder how that works because obviously it's manipulation if you as an individual with let's say $100, billion, uh, like $100 million in a stock, if you're just dumping that stock with some malice intention, that's clearly mm. market manipulation. But what if there's a lot of very small investors, which is kind of what we're seeing with this Reddit thing. Mm. You, it's not one person that's forcing um, all of this in the market. It's a band of people grouping together. So, mm. I don't know. And how can you how can you prove that someone that's on the Wall Street Bets forum is buying it in the intention to manipulate the stock market? You could always just say that, yeah, I'm just going long GameStop. Yeah, I guess the only way would be is... It, maybe if they could trace who posted something, if you posted yeah, if they something, found evidence. yeah, if they found evidence that you you were that you basically claimed or showed that you were buying the stock to force a, a short squeeze, yeah, I don't I don't even know if that is market manipulation actually. Who knows? If that is, then they could do that, I guess. But mm. it's very strange, very very interesting to me. This just highlights that because the community is big, but it's not huge and GameStop mm. is a big stock like it was valued at a couple billion dollars now it's at like 25 billion but yeah. it was <laughs> it reasonably before everyone went crazy it was at about a couple billion dollars um, so to me it just demonstrates that it is so obvious to me that someone with a, a large YouTube channel could push a stock that's worth a hundred million dollars with their mm. audience of a few hundred thousand like that yeah. to me, this just demonstrates to me that there is absolutely zero doubt in my mind that you could do that with a large YouTube yeah. audience. Oh yeah. Like previously sure. I was like, you know, maybe it's possible. I don't actually know if it's possible, but now I, I have zero doubt that it's possible. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Because I guess the thing is, is that, yeah, it, it, it doesn't necessarily matter how big the stock is. It's, I guess it's about more the da the average daily volume. Um, if you can cause a massive, di so I don't know, may, the the two are, are quite linked: the average daily volume and actually yeah, the size, like the yeah. market cap. But but not but you know not always. There can be some differentiation. But yeah, if you have a small daily volume stock and you get your buddies to buy in, then yeah, you can definitely you can definitely manipulate. In some, I remember like Phil Town talked about it in his book in his early days when he was a bit younger and, and didn't quite understand what was happening. He was saying that he, on some of the small stocks he had found that he liked, he was manipulating, he was causing just him investing himself, like putting tens of thousand dollars into a stock, that was causing a major disruption in the daily volume, which was driving the stock <laughs> price up. So, he was like, oh yeah, I love this. You know, I keep investing and my stocks go up. But then of course, the stocks go back down when you try and sell because you're basically the you only are the big volume. player. In <laughs> yeah, you are the volume exactly. <laughs> oh dear, but yeah, it's, it's quite funny, isn't it? Yeah. What a, what a story! What an just a crazy story, man. The stock market stonks only go up. <laughs> Jeez, oh, God. it just stories like this becoming more frequent just makes me kind of more nervous for the overall yeah. state of the market, to be honest. Yeah. Meanwhile, at universities all around the world, business students are learning about efficient market hypothesis. Yeah. And how markets that. are always efficient and exactly. investors GameStop, <laughs> it, it deserves to have gone up yeah. 1,641. I mean, investors <laughs> clearly always act on all available information entirely rationally. Clearly. Yeah. We've got Clearly. great evidence. It's obvious, Hamish. Yeah, yeah. Come on. It's so obvious. <laughs> Jeez. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should we move on? Yes. We should get into Hit some, me with uh, Facebook. What's going on in Facebook? I haven't had a chance to have a look at their earnings yet. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. So we, we've got a number of earnings to get through. So we probably won't spend too much time on each of them. But yeah. um, Facebook, of course, reported their full year earnings like a number of companies will be have done today and, and will be doing uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, so just to give you some of the top level numbers first, revenue came in at $86 billion, which was up 22% year over year. So um, pretty substantial increase. 
in their total revenue for the year. It's pretty good. Um, I think in the- Considering what happened in 2020, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, clearly they they in part benefited you know, in a way from yeah. from people using their services more and businesses accelerating their plans to to set up their businesses online and and transfer their advertising dollars online. Um, mm. They actually mentioned something that was interesting. Just remember, just from you saying that there was actually there was a decrease in they noticed a decrease in advertisers advertiser spending on um, services, but there was actually an increase over twenty nineteen in products. So. Um, it was a record year, basically, for for product demand, um, at least in the United States, which is uh, fascinating considering it was a global pandemic. Um, yeah, wow. But basically, the, in terms of their user numbers, which is obviously one of the major drivers of, of their revenue growth, um, daily active users for Facebook, just the Facebook platform, came in at 1.84 billion, which was up 11% year over year. Uh, monthly Jeez. active users was 2.8 billion, up 12% year over year. So still getting double digit growth <laughs> out of their <laughs> business. Wow. Uh, in- do, you, do you know by chance, do you know where that growth is is coming from? Wasn't it last quarter that were, we were talking about India or something like that? Um, off the top of my head, I don't That's know. Right. Although That's I right. do know that the daily active users in the in North America uh, declined for I think the third quarter in a row. So wow, so um, it's, it's basically all international. Yes. So bas- North America has basically been f- flattened, very minor growth um, quarter over quarter, like one or two percent for the past few quarters, uh, and then it declined because they got a huge increase at the start of uh, 2020 uh, at the end of. Uh, 2019 it must have been right um yep. but yeah it, it's coming internationally and a big part of that would be coming out of out of india wow um Jeez. in terms of their family of daily active people which is this number that yes. now includes everything so it includes whatsapp and instagram and messenger and facebook uh this daily figure came in at 2.6 billion up 15 percent year over year huge increase and uh that same figure but how many people logged in monthly was 3.3 billion. Holy shit. Up 14% year over year. What's the global population at the moment? I'm going to look that yeah. up right now. Have a global look. Global population. I think it's less than nine. I think it's eight point it something. It is 7.8 billion 7. people. Okay. So, count, how, what was three, Facebook's 3. family? 3.3 3 divided by 7.8. divided by 7 point, Whoopsies. I just typed in the wrong thing. Whoop. Go Quick start math. again. Start again. Math three point three over seven point eight. So forty two percent of the Earth's population. Yep. Uses one of Facebook's Actually, apps. You know what would be a better monthly. search? Can you look up how many people in the world have access to the internet? Because that, yeah, well, if you exclude all the people who don't even have access to the internet, the number must be insanely high. I don't know. Yeah. I wish I'd looked that up before. But yes, um, they've continued to achieve huge double-digit growth in across not only their main Facebook platform, but um, across all of their products when we combine them. The one thing I would like to see is if they broke out Instagram and, and WhatsApp in the same way they break out Facebook. Uh, that would be interesting yeah. to me. But I, uh, I, found, I found the number. Ooh. So 4.33 billion active <laughs> internet users worldwide. So 3.3 over 4.33. So 76% of everybody that has access to the internet will use one of Facebook's apps each month. Correct. Yeah. What the heck? And more than one in two use it every single day. What? That is, well, I mean, that, that, wow, that, that is, that's bonkers. Yeah. That literally blows my mind. That is in. Sane. Yeah. So to all those people who love to to hate on Facebook and how it's a terrible service, you're still using it. Yeah, you are still <laughs> using it. Well, that's the thing. I still use it. I mean, I don't use Facebook, the app, as much anymore. No, I don't. But either. I use Messenger all the time, and I yeah. certainly use Instagram a fair bit. Yes. Um, I don't use WhatsApp though. I have Messenger instead. But um, yeah. Whoa. Jeez, insane. Sorry. Anyway, no, it's just it, it is it is crazy. And I mean, we say this every time we look at their quarterly results, but they just keep growing. So uh, they do. When's it gonna? I don't know. It's just uh, 
I think we made this joke last time, but it's probably at this stage, it's just Mark Zuckerberg, 3,894, yeah, yeah. Mark Zuckerberg, 3,894. <laughs> that, that is true. That's the other thing, right? That, that's an accounts number probably um, or an estimate. So, it's not, maybe it's less than 75% of I wonder of if Facebook but- does any account cleaning and closing old accounts because I know YouTube does that. Like every so mm. often you'll get a reduction in your subscribers yes. because uh, some of those subscribers will be uh, fake. So, um, YouTube trims off uh, accounts that are not real. Inactive um, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but, and for someone like, you know, the top dogs like PewDiePie, they lose like four or five million subscribers <laughs> <laughs> when they do that, which is just insane. Yeah. I don't know if Facebook does that. I, I, got no I idea would presume well. I mean, that they would, y- but- I would presume they would as well, but then again, it makes their numbers look worse. So, it's almost like I, I wouldn't be surprised if they just let it go. You know? Yeah, I, I thought about that too, but then it also makes their revenue per user worse. Oh, so that's true. it's kind of like a balance. Like if they, they could amplify yeah. their user numbers with fake accounts, but then that would hurt their, their revenue per user. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Which in my view, revenue per user is the, the real key number here going forward. True. Because if they really do, which or they clearly have near uh, 75% of people who have access to the internet using their services, the growth is... Mm primarily going to be coming from uh, advertisers spending more money in front of those users rather than more users coming on the platform. Unless we find an alien race that we can inflict (laughs) Facebook upon. (laughs) I think we're just about there. (laughs) So, yeah, you know, you're right. Revenue per user will be very important. Sorry, back to the financials. Yes. So, in terms of profits, that's kind of some of their revenue numbers. Uh, Earnings per share came in at $10.09, which was up 57% year over year. Huge increase in profits. Uh, And uh, this is primarily due to operating margins continuing to improve. So, revenue is growing at a much faster faster rate than expenses. And uh, this is much of a term- turnaround after what happened in 2018 and 2019, where we had that whole Cambridge Analytica data breach in, in, in Europe and um, they were being investigated for, for privacy and security. And through that process, they basically started spending a huge amount more on privacy just to to, to show regulators that they're, they're making strides and also just to protect data and make sure that something like Cambridge Analytica doesn't happen again. Um, but now their operating margins are, are growing again. Um, so they're back up to 46% was their operating margin in the latest quarter. Uh, it's pretty insane, that's, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a ridiculous profit margin, 50% yeah. before taxes is uh wow. yeah you don't see wow. that every day you keep like you keep half of what you make that's insane that's insane yeah power of uh, software based business absolutely yeah in terms of free cash flow so in terms of their cash profits uh that came in at uh, 23.6 billion dollars which was up 11% year over year so uh that one grew a little bit slower than earnings per share, but uh, still, still not bad. Impressive. Um, and then there was a couple of headwinds. I won't go through, I won't sort of go into detail of all of these, um, but basically Zuckerberg on the call conference call this morning addressed a number of headwinds that the business is likely to face next year. One of the things I really like about Zuckerberg is he just, he basically says the truth of what's happening rather than right. just trying to fluff up the business. But um, the main concern is iOS 14, um, which is Apple's new operating system for iPhones. It's going to stop Facebook from running some of their audience network ads, which is ads within third-party apps. So, if you're just playing a game and sometimes you see an ad, some of those ads will be Facebook ads, but not on iPhones anymore. Um, And that's clearly going to hurt advertiser revenue uh, or the the advertiser segment of of Facebook's business. Um, And they said that would start in Q1 of 2021. And then there was another a couple of other issues. European regulations continue to be a problem, um, as well as uh, he also addressed some issues around uh, whole, around um, criticisms of, of Facebook having significant amounts of user data. Um, but mm. yeah, I guess if you want to see the full um, his full speech, he spoke for about twenty minutes, so it's quite a <laughs> quite a lengthy speech. Um, you can check out the latest conference call, which is on the investor relations page. Right. Cool. Yeah, I'll have to. I haven't had a chance to listen to it. I guess these earnings would have just come out, though, right? When did they come yeah, out? Yeah, they came out this Today. morning. Yeah, so this the morning. conference call yeah. was about an hour ago. Yeah. Oh, I've got some work to do tonight. <laughs> I've got a lot of conference calls to listen to. Um, but uh, is that all we got for Facebook? Yeah, that's that's pretty much all I had. 
There was nothing cool. nothing too dramatic on the stock price. Went down two percent during the day and then up half a percent in after hours. Yeah. All right, let's move on. We can talk mm. about Tesla if you want. Yeah. Let's do our um Tesla segment. <laughs> our <laughs> Tesla <laughs> segment. Yeah. <laughs> Musk watch. Um, so Tesla Q4 and full year numbers uh, just came out. Haven't listened to their conference call because it's happening as is happening right now, <laughs> as as we record this. Um, so uh, nothing drastic happened with the stock, which is kind of weird. Um, stock dropped two percent and then three point one five percent after hours. Uh, which is bonkers considering the, the normal volatility. This has like been one of the most stable days for Tesla <laughs> in a long time and it's an earnings day. But we'll start off with some Q4 numbers and then we'll talk about the full year 2020. So uh, Q4, they did $9.3 billion in automotive revenue, which is up 46% year over year. It's pretty impressive growth from a car manufacturer. Mm. Um, $10.7 billion in total revenue. They did total gross profit of guess how much two billion dollars. Wow! <laughs> out of out of ten, it's pretty insane. This is like a perfect contrast, to like the Facebook story <laughs> from before. You do ten point seven billion dollars of revenue, and your total gross profit is two billion. Yeah, and, and that's gross <laughs> profit, not even operating. Profit I know. At this point. I know. Facebook's operating. operating. Facebook's gross profit margin is. Uh, a hundred percent. I don't know. What is it? 99% yeah, or something, something insane. So providing a service, I guess is yeah. not too many gross expenses um, there, but yeah, but we've got, uh, so operating income. So this is <laughs> it's pretty insane. So total revenue, $10.7 billion mm. operating income of $575 million, <laughs> Wow, <laughs> which is actually pretty good. Like for Tesla. Yeah. Um, 5%, but yeah. 5% operating margin. Yeah, pretty insane. <laughs> Which is good um, for a car manufacturer, by the way. It is. It is. It's just hilarious that we're putting these results right after Facebook because yeah. <laughs> the contrast is is very obvious. Um, then operating cash flow, uh, $3 billion, up 112% year over year. Ooh. So, that's quite good. Uh, well, it's better than quite good. Uh, then free cash flow, $1.868 billion, up 84% year over year. Very good. So overall, definitely Tesla's best year, uh, sorry, best uh, best quarter, I should say. Mm. Um, they did uh, extremely well in this quarter um, based on what they normally do. In terms of operational data, they uh, produced and delivered 180,000 cars in the quarter. Uh, they had 86 megawatts of solar deployed, which is up 59% year over year. So that's going well as well, although there's still a long, long way to go mm. with the solar. That's, that's still tiny, 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 tiny. Um, then in terms of the energy storage, so grid scale and uh, batteries and power walls, they did 1,584 megawatt hours of storage deployed, which is a big jump up from uh, 759 uh, megawatt hours last quarter, and that's up 200% year over year. Other notable things out of the release, Shanghai Gigafactory is now delivering, producing and delivering Model Ys. Hmm. Gigafactory Berlin and Austin are on track for production in 2021 um, at the end of the year, which is great. Uh, and I had a look at their estimated production capacity. And right now, they've got a production capacity of 1,050,000 units per year. And that's just from their Fremont factory and their Shanghai factory. That's not including anything Berlin or Austin, which is pretty insane. Wow. Because in 2020, they delivered 500,000 cars. So, and they have guided that they're going to, over over a period of time, it'll average out to about 50% annual growth in vehicle deliveries. So, man, they're going to they're going to do better than that, it seems, if they can utilize that full um, unit capacity, unit production capacity this year. Yeah, I wonder, that just makes me think of a couple of questions. Like one would be, um, one would be, it'll be certainly interesting to see if demand reaches their capacity. But the other thing is, mm. I wonder if there are other constraints other than just that capacity number. Like, I wonder if, if there is demand for a million vehicles in 2021 or a million new vehicles, uh, is, is there anything else that could be a bottleneck in, in that process? Mm. Or is it just that we have the capacity, so if there is a million demand for a million, we will make a million? I presume yeah. there's other bottlenecks, but um, 
it's uh, yeah, that's that's a fascinating number. It's good to know that they have a lot of runway in front of them now, um, which they didn't have previously. Yeah, I'm just trying to have a look on that point. I'm just scrolling through. Da, 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 da. Um, the rate of growth will depend on our. This is straight from their um, release. Hmm. The rate of growth will depend on our equipment capacity, operational efficiency and capacity and stability of the supply chain. So, you're right. There are some other factors. For instance, the supply chain could, uh, you know, if there were any issues, then that would obviously um, halt them because with a car, it's made of so many different parts. Tesla makes a lot of those parts themselves, but still gets a lot from other suppliers. Um, And when it comes to a finished product like a car, your production line's only as fast as your slowest part. (laughs) That is true. Yeah. I mean, there could be a material that they need that they can't access or that is overly mm. expensive because of the amount they need to source or there could be a wide range of things that could that could limit them but um certainly capacities i think probably like the key thing that we people Definitely. would be looking at um that's really interesting yeah. that's exciting yeah and i always think like oh geez you know they did 500,000 cars in 2020 and now they've got capacity for a million like geez is there going to be that much demand is there going to be a million people that are per year that are going to want to buy a Tesla. But I actually think that that won't be a problem considering if you look at the other auto manufacturers, Tesla is tiny. Mm. Tesla can't make like any cars versus the other manufacturers. Other manufacturers make like tens of millions of cars a year, Mm. which is just insane. So um, I actually don't think demand will be a problem provided their products continue to uh, improve in affordability and whatnot. Yeah. Um, That might be a bottleneck is the amount of people that are actually willing to pay the price for the car. But anyway, Um, other things operationally. uh, Interestingly, they just refreshed the Model S and the Model X. Did you see the photos? No, I haven't actually. No, you didn't. Minor changes to the exterior and to the wheels on both of those models, but major changes to the interior. They basically have completely changed the interior look of the Model S and the Model X. It's a little bit more in line with the Model 3 and the Y, wow. but it is more, much more premium. You've got more screens. You've got a screen for the rear passengers. Um, there's now a landscape screen like the Model 3 and Model Y. There's a new steering wheel. It's not like, not even a steering wheel now. It's a steering yoke. <laughs> um, and, man, it looks it looks like the future. It it looks very interesting. It looks way sh- better. I'm just looking at it Are now. Are you looking yeah, at it now? Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's, so, they've got- Is that three screens now or is it just two? And then- No, there's three there's screens. Three. There's one in front of the driver. There's the center main control hub screen. Yes. And then there's one for the rear passengers. Wow. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's pretty insane. And a- Apparently, that screen on the for the rear passengers, you can just play video games on that, and you can <laughs> um, you can just connect wireless controllers, like you can connect your Xbox controller to it. So if you got kids in the car and you're driving to I don't know Sydney or something, you could just give them a couple of controllers, say play some video games for a couple of hours, and that's uh, that'll shut them up. That's great. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, it looks it looks great. Go on to uh, Tesla Investor Relations if you're interested. Open their most the most recent shareholder deck and slide down to the photos section, and you'll be able to see the photos. Or you can just go onto the Tesla Model S or Model X Design Studio, and you can have a look at the interior tab. Anyway, very quickly, that was Q4 2020. As I said before, 500,000 cars delivered, Ooh. automotive revenue 27.2 billion, up 31% year over year. Total revenue uh, 31.5 billion, up 28% year over year. Uh, operating income this year, I put that in bold and in italics <laughs> because b- before now it's been operating loss. So, operating income this year of $1.99 billion uh, versus negative $69 million in 2019. Mm. Full year operating margin is now positive, which is good, <laughs> 6.3% versus negative 0.3% last year. Operating cash flow, $6 billion, up 147% year over year. Free cash flow, $2.8 uh, uh, billion, up 158% year over year. And they're cu- looking to the balance sheet, they've got current cash of $19 billion, which is up 209% year over year. A uh, combination of really strong free cash flow and uh, capital raising as well. 
Right. In terms of their outlook, just very quickly to finish off, over a, they say over a, they've changed how they're doing their guidance now. They're not going to do, this is what we expect in 2021. This is what we expect in 2022. They just say, over a multi-year horizon, we expect to achieve 50% average annual growth in our vehicle deliveries. In some years, we may grow faster, which we expect to be the case in 2021. Wow. So, there you go. Well, it makes sense in 2021 because they've got two, well, firstly, they've got the Model Y ramp happening in China, right. but they've also got two new factories coming online in 2021. So, that should definitely help. <laughs> yeah. I mean, their business is growing at a ridiculous rate. Yeah. Uh, They're really uh, putting the pillars into place, aren't they? Yeah. For, future, for the future. They definitely are. I just did a quick... Uh, mm. PE calculation because I was curious oh, gosh. for um, yeah, go. price compared to free cash flow, which is actually yeah, go, a much yeah. better measure in, in my opinion. Yeah, but, it is. Um, yeah. So that is currently 292. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, that's I mean, look. The th- what would be the average price to free cash flow? Like 15? The average of the like the market? No, or? Yeah, just just like generally. What, yeah, what do businesses it would probably, generally sell Well, for? assuming that earnings should be similar to- to, to cash flow over time, it you would imagine about 15, mm. between 15. Yeah. At the moment, probably a bit higher, probably like More. 25 or something, I would probably, say, yeah. maybe in that range. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? If they grow at 50% per year, that's obviously insane, but they would still, they would need to achieve that and the stock price would need to be flat for a long time for it to get to a reasonable for valuation. It to, for it to meet, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. No, I agree. I agree. Like, no, I don't. Uh, I don't deny a Tesla stock is overvalued. Yeah, but uh, it, I, I like to look at Tesla's business. Um, you know, I'm I'm certainly not buying Tesla stock at the current price. But yeah, yeah. Um, as a company that I just like to see them succeed, I just like to. Yeah, it's it's good to see all these numbers coming out of Tesla. Yeah, I mean, if they double their cash flow over the next in 2021, and the stock price doesn't move, they'll still be at a PE or a price to free cash flow of 150. So just keep that in mind, everybody. Just yeah. Tread with caution. No financial advice. No financial but- advice, but. But Tesla stock is wild. <laughs> it is wild. Who knows? What, yeah. what do we make? Predi- we did make, make predictions about what we thought Tesla would do in 2021, oh, didn't did we? we? I think we did at the start of the I year. I don't know. I'll have to go I back. I'll listen to it during the week and uh, try and find it for next week. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, um, yeah, we'll kind of see what happens with that, I guess. Yeah. Should we uh, leave Tesla there going to Apple? Yes. Bring it home. Yeah. We won't, I won't lag too long here on Apple. Mm. Um, I, there really wasn't that much to read, um, but really good, really, really good um, quarter mm. from Apple, uh, a, like a record-breaking quarter. Right. Um, yeah. So, obviously, this is uh, stupid Apple uh, reporting their Q1 earnings, <laughs> uh, even though it is the- you know, the calendar Q4. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, they, the, this here's, how's this for a quote from the Apple CFO, Luca Maestri, I think is how you pronounce it. Our December quarter uh, business performance was fueled by double digit growth in each product category. You know, your business is doing mm. all right if you can say that. <laughs> that is crazy. Double digit growth in each product category. So, let's talk about it. Um, it has it was a stellar, stellar <laughs> quarter from Apple. Q1 revenue was 111 <laughs> billion, which is up from 91 billion in Q1 last year. Now let's talk about each of their product segments. iPhone, which is their biggest and best, uh, went from 56 billion to 66 billion year over year. So, comparing to Q1 of last year. Mm-hmm. So, 56 to 66, that's impressive growth. iPad, 6 billion to 8 billion. Mac, 7 billion to 8.7 billion. Services, 12.7 billion to 15.7 billion. Then other revenue, 10 billion to 13 billion. So, very impressive wow. by revenue standards to get that level of growth in literally each category. Um, very impressive. So well done. It seems that everyone got an iPhone for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? The iPhone <laughs> revenue going up so much. Doesn't everyone have one by now? Yeah, I know. Ten billion dollars year over year. It's pretty pretty crazy. Wow. 
Um, then in terms of gross profit, gross profit went from $35.2 billion in Q1 2019, uh, yeah, 2019 to, uh, or 2020, sorry, to $44.3 billion Q1 2021. Mm-hmm. Uh, operating income twenty five point six billion to thirty three point five billion year over year. Uh, quarterly earnings per diluted share of one dollar sixty eight, uh, up thirty five percent year over year. All these stats are just pretty darn impressive. Uh, operating cash flow thirty point five billion to thirty eight point seven billion. Free cash flow twenty eight point four billion to thirty five point two six billion. And overall, they've now got a cash pile of 195 billion. <laughs> um, they've got debt of 107 billion, so they've got net cash of 88 billion dollars. Oh my god! Dear, oh dear, oh dear! 195. Use that. Make that Apple electric car or something. Yeah, you should have bought Tesla. I yeah, I sh- <laughs> <they laughs> told you, Tim Cook. I said. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I said, do it. <laughs> Elon even Musk wanted to said, meet up with you Musk about that. Said, do it. Yeah. And you yeah. spat in their face and you could have been yeah. look at you, you could have been a what, what are they even worth now? 2 trillion? You could have been a 3 yeah, trillion dollar over com- 2 trillion company. It's just ridiculous that a company of that size is pulling numbers like this. Is it is growth isn't it? numbers like this. It is. Um, yes. Yeah. It's just pure insanity. Um It is. I'll be honest, I haven't caught up with Apple um, deeply for even quite some time now. Uh, yeah. But it still blows my mind that uh, what is happening, considering it, what was it, 2015, I think it was, when mm. iPhone numbers, when they stopped reporting iPhone numbers or they stopped reporting a little bit later. But in 2015, iPhone numbers basically were flat. The unit growth had kind of flattened out for a year mm. and the stock got absolutely slammed by that. Um, and yeah. now to, to, to look back on that five, whatever, whatever that is, five, four or five years ago now or five, six years ago now, <laughs> and they've just continued just a, to grow that category at a ridiculous yep. rate is, uh, is insane. Yep. It's like a bug on the windshield now, what was going on five <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Pretty much. And doesn't, isn't that interesting? That tells, it really tells you a powerful story about, you know, f- not getting caught up in the short term. And finding high quality businesses and just follow them for a very long. I mean, even this is not it's not a very long period of time, but give them give them some years. You know, don't just don't give them three months to prove their worth. You know, give them give them a couple of years, and yeah, the, the stuff we're talking about, however many years ago, is now just completely irrelevant because you know, even if they're not growing their units of iPhones, then well, fifty six billion to sixty six billion. Year over year in revenue, that's still pretty darn impressive. So yeah, yeah, insane. Um, I think that's just about all I've got to say for Apple. Uh, mm. What else? Stock went up twelve percent in the week leading up to earnings, right. but didn't really do much in reaction. Uh, it was down 077 percent today, and then down three percent after hours. So I guess three percent is a fair drop, but nothing, nothing <laughs> crazy. Not like they dumped. 15 or added 15 percent i'm surprised that it went down to be honest <laughs> they must have been i mean were analysts expecting better than this yeah uh, I, they must I, have i guess so i mean i'm looking at their, yeah, I'm looking so at their well. stock they're at a PE of 43 so clearly pretty crazy investors are expecting a lot out of the business mm. which is a dramatic change to, to as i said like just a, four years ago the stock was at a PE mm. of six i think or something yeah something i think ridiculous. warren buffett buffett bought in like a p of under 15 didn't yes he? yeah yeah. I, yeah it was it was under 10 for a long time and i think there was a, t- a period where it was even in single digits where it was wow five, six or seven um and now Jeez. it's at 40 which just shows you right their business has grown at double digits so ju- they're just their profits but on top of that the price that you paid compared to earnings has gone four times so even if so you've you've made a 15 percent return on the stock from since 2015 just on just on the price increasing not thinking about earnings at all and then earnings have grown it i'm guessing probably more than 10 percent over the past five years per year mm. which is just crazy so what happens yep. if you can combine buying a really great business that has growth potential with buying it when it's unloved 
during some kind of short-term problem or a, a problem you perceive as short-term. Because I guess at the time, no one really knew for sure what was going to happen with that iPhone category, but you could have you could have bet that um, even with the flattening numbers that they were going to be able to continue to grow that and other parts of their business. But certainly, certainly very fascinating what, what they've been able to do. And uh, yeah. I, I keep wondering every single year, I, I wonder, is this the year where they just turn into a cash cow where they stop growing and it just yeah. doesn't seem to be happening. <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting because they kind of pull those moves where they're just, you know, doing buybacks, paying dividends, whatever, Yeah, but they still get great growth. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there will be a point where Tim Cook just flicks the switch and goes full buyback, full dividend mode. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I don't want that to be what Apple is known for. I want Apple to be, you know, the Steve Jobs kind of Apple where they're innovating mm. and making new stuff and and pushing technology forward, um, making the next big thing, you know. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see whether they do that. Yeah. Um, all right. Should we leave that there? We've probably got time to do maybe one or two Q&A questions. Should we do some yes, Q&A questions? Yes, that's a good idea. Let's uh, jump into right, it. Sure. Do, do, you, do you want to pick one? Yeah, I'll pick one. Uh, do we already no, we just should just start at the top? Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Great podcast as always. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, even some friends that don't know uh, nothing about Bitcoin or the stock market want to buy. I told them to stay away. The problem at the moment is that almost everything is overpriced. Stocks, real estate, Bitcoin, etc. Uh, and cash is losing value due to the heavy mo- uh, printing, uh, money printing that is. Uh, but where do you put it? Where do you put your money? Yeah. It's a good question, isn't it? Because you're right. I mean... Obviously, the super low interest rates means that, you know, we've got inflation in asset prices, in stocks yeah. and in, in real estate. Um, people are, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of money printing going on, which means that cash loses its buying power and people don't want to necessarily hold a lot of cash. And obviously, over the long term, holding a lot of cash is a very poor strategy. Um, then there's been the rise of Bitcoin where Bitcoin is like a, you know, obviously it's like gold, except it doesn't really have an, any sort of intrinsic value, but people just think because there's a finite amount of Bitcoin, then maybe that's a better store of wealth. So this is, this is a difficult question to, to answer. Like, where do you put your money? Um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, we've just got to keep, I mean, I think it's a good strategy to have most of your money, it, you know, if this works for you and obviously it won't work for you. But for, for me, I certainly like to think I, I like to have most of my money in cash producing assets that are going to grow so that hopefully that money can grow and outpace inflation and, you know, um, over time owning a slice of companies that will grow into the future is kind of protecting uh, my it, that that is my store of value. That's my store of wealth in owning a slice of something that continues to increase in value. Mm. But you're right. There's so many. Obviously, most stocks right now are really overvalued. So, like I think there's uh, at a level there's some compromising happening where I can't, you know, I'm settling for for smaller margin of safeties instead of, you know, getting, you know, 15% per year. Well, if I can get 10% per year, then that's still, you know, a, a decent return because, you know, you don't want to just find nothing and then end up with so much money on the sidelines. Yeah. And then in a couple of years from now, that cash is just, you know, worth so much less. But it is a really tough question, I guess. What what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it is. I think there's a couple of ways you can go about it. If you want to go broadly into an index fund, then you can kind of just accept that we don't really know how long interest rates are going to be low, what inflation is going to be like, and then therefore we don't really know what the market's going to do. But you can just buy broadly into it consistently over time and accept what the market provides you. And that's probably, I mean, that, that, that's what I do for part of my portfolio as kind of a foundation. And that's what mm. a, a lot of people will be doing at the moment, just consistently contributing. Um, I mean, if you're picking individual businesses or picking individual investments, then you really just have to look at the investments you understand and, and what returns they're offering you. And and that's what the market's offering at the moment. And, and at the moment, that's a lot less 
than it is historically mm. on or on average. So it, it makes it very challenging. Um, it kind of puts investors in a crossroads. It's either take more risk to try and make the same returns as before, uh, but with more risk associated because you're paying more for those assets or going into yeah. riskier asset classes, or you maintain the same level of risk and accept that you can't find or it's harder to find investments um, yielding the same returns at those low risk levels. I find myself falling into that first camp. You'll see a lot of people. We spoke about some some people today who fall into the latter camp where they're, or, or the, the, the first thing I mentioned, where they're taking more risk, they're speculating on investments, gambling to ma- get the same returns as they could previously without taking that level of risk. But personally, mm. I am happy to accept a lower return while maintaining low risk. And I mean, historically speaking, when everything's been expensive, when interest rates are low, when there's a lot of money printing, there has been inflation and that reverses the trend that brings asset prices down. And and then yeah. once again, you can can invest in businesses, get a safe 15% return uh, with low risk. Um, mm. That's, yeah, I'm not finding those opportunities at the moment. So... As I yep. said, I'm doing a little bit of consistently adding into the into the broad market, accepting what the broad market is offering, and then I'm I'm looking for individual opportunities and seeing what the market's offering me. Yep, fair. No, I agree. I agree. All right, let's do one more here. Uh, hey, gents, I have a question about using margin of safety. I know Hamish will always use a 22% discount rate for a 50% margin of safety. Would either of you consider using a higher or lower margin of safety depending on the business you are looking at, e.g. Uh, perhaps buying Zoom or Peloton would require a larger margin of safety than a business like Berkshire Hathaway? Thanks, fellas. Keep up the great work. What do you think to this one, Hamish? Um- Yeah, I mean, in a way you could do that. You could have a larger margin of safety where there's more uncertainty. But personally, I just don't, I would just not even consider investing in businesses that have a lot of uncertainty. Um, The margin of safety to me isn't sort of, it's not a thing where you can just add more of a margin of safety and that kind of protects you against the risk of of the business. Um, It kind of Mm. works where you need to still be investing in quite safe businesses with relatively low risk. And then you still add the margin of safety on top because even in those businesses, something risky can happen. But in a business like Peloton, for example, where they're in a high growth mode, um, I don't actually know if they're profitable or not. I would presume that I don't think they are, but maybe they've been profitable for a couple of years. But the future for that that business is so uncertain. There's so many possible outcomes. It could be really great. It could be really terrible. Um, And in those businesses... First of all, you'll never be able to buy it at a large margin of safety because their speculators push the price up really high. Um, but the other thing is that the margin of safety doesn't really protect you in that way. Like think of it this way. Yeah. If a business has a huge amount of debt, it doesn't matter how low the stock price goes. I'm not interested because it could yeah. still go bankrupt. Whereas, so so paying a lower price doesn't protect you against the fact that the business has high debt. Um, paying mm. the lower price can only protect you for, say, the business doesn't perform as well as you expect. Um, exactly. If that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. It was a bit yeah. of a wishy-washy answer, but. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I understand. Yeah, no, I think that it's like, I, I always go step one, high quality business, mm. then step two, find it a margin of safety price. Because you're right, the high quality business part is, you know, making sure that it's got a competitive advantage, it's got strong growth over a long track record, it's got low debt, good management team and whatever. Um, so, if you don't, if you have maybe a, a, a new company with a CEO that isn't proven, that's using a lot of debt, but maybe is promising the world in terms of growth, then that's just that's just like a step. That's that doesn't really meet step one. That's not a. It's not like a high. What we would call a high quality business. So that in itself, that's going to cause a lot of risk in your investment. And and that that's just not related to the margin of safety. That's just a, a risky investment. Yeah. Um, so because, yeah, I think that the margin of safety, that's, that's not to try and – the margin of safety is not implemented to try and – um, what am I trying to say here? The margin of safety is trying it's it's trying to account for the errors that you make in the predictions, which I guess is what this one's talking about. But 
I, th- I think, yeah. I mean, I, the, the, I don't, I don't there's know. some errors I think that a margin of safety helps with, which I think the main one is if the business doesn't perform as you expect. So they make, yeah. like, just as a broad example, they make $100, billion, $100 million over the course of the next 10 years instead of the $200 million that you expected. With a margin yeah. of safety, you can protect against that because if you pay a lower price, then you've got a better relationship between the cash flows you get or the business produces and the price that you paid. But the margin of safety can't reduce the risk of, say, if the CEO is being investigated for fraud. And there's yeah. a good chance yeah, that yeah. the numbers are just dodgy That's a good way of right it. like if the number if, if mm. there's a good chance the numbers are dodgy doesn't matter what price you pay if, if it turns mm. out the ceo did that the company is stuffed and the same thing i think is true for debt um so that's the way i think about it i don't know if that's i don't know that's probably a much better that's a much better explanation than what i, what I was trying to do <laughs> no, i think that's what you're trying to say though um yeah so yeah. yeah i just didn't didn't have the words my vocabulary <laughs> Oh dear. No, but ho- I hope that helps. Um, but yeah, anyway, should we wrap things up? That's been an hour. Man, yeah, there's so much to talk oh. about. And it's going to be like that for the next couple of weeks. We're going to have so, so many companies to talk I about. I know. It's going to be crazy. And uh, as yep. we said last week, um, if you have any big companies that, um, of course, that will be applicable to a lot of people that you want us to, to take a look at, because there is going to be so many, we kind of need a way to to filter through what you guys want to see, uh, then make yep. sure you head over to the YouTube version of the podcast. That's at youtube.com forward slash the young investors podcast just click on the latest episode and you can leave us your questions your topics news topics or any companies if you want us to cover for earnings and as i said we probably won't cover like smaller companies or very specific companies if if, if it's in the yeah. top 500 or top uh, not 500 top 50 biggest companies big names yeah big names big brand names then then we'll, we'll consider taking a look at that but um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Hope everyone enjoyed yes. today's episode. Thanks ShareSite for yeah. sponsoring as always. Get four months free off a yearly subscription or try a free plan forever if you want, for as long as you want. Uh, head over to ShareSite.com forward slash, uh, what did I just, what is it? Young Investors. The share young si- invest- yeah. <laughs> I didn't have it share up in front of me. forward slash Young Investors. ShareSite.com forward slash Young Investors. Go check it out. Thanks Brandon for joining me as always. OG. And I hope you guys have a good week. See you later, guys. See you guys.